Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome on Thursday, the 25th of October, to this, this live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It's a great pleasure that you could join in. And oh, I've had some absolutely fantastic questions this week coming in that I can't wait to start answering with you. It's been a busy week here. On Monday, I was in Oxford uh, giving a research seminar thinking about sights, smells and sounds that surrounded people as they approached ancient Greek sanctuaries. On Tuesday, I was uh, doing PhD supervisions and master's uh, supervisions with my students. And on Wednesday, I was deep into ancient global history with my undergraduates at Warwick. Hello, everyone. How uh, so glad that you could join. Uh, we were into ancient global history with the undergrads on Wednesday morning, and we were deep into India and the uh, Mauryan Empire and the great edicts of Ashoka, as some of you may have seen through my Instagram account. I couldn't help but tweet out some of the images that we were looking at. Hello. Hello everyone, great that you could join us. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. So let's get stuck in. Uh, we had a great question from Debbie Porter, uh, who is off to Naples next spring. Lucky Debbie. And uh, alongside going to see Pompeii and Herculaneum, they've got two days free on their agenda. What should they go and see? Well, top tip from me in Naples itself is to get to see the underground Greek and well, Greco uh, Roman Agora marketplace, the Forum that you can see that is literally underneath uh, modern Naples. You access it through a church and you can get to actually walk in the footsteps of an ancient for Roman forum and below that uh, the original Greek agora of the town of Neapolis, the new town as it was called by the Greek colonial founders. Um, but what you can also do uh, in Naples itself is go and visit the Bourbon Tunnels and we were there when we did Italy's Invisible Cities those underground tunnels that were partly older bits that were connected up by the later Bourbon rulers often used as uh, well intended to be used as escape tunnels uh, for them from their palaces that were then later used as bomb shelters during the Second World War for the residents of Naples so they're worth seeing and then get outside Naples and go to Baia Baia is the ancient Roman seaside resort town. Hi Willow, how are you doing? You were at the open day last week. So glad that you could come and see us at Warwick. Great, great, great. Hopefully we convinced you uh, that you would uh, like to apply to come and join us to study classics at Warwick uh, in the future. Really, really hope so. Hi Debbie, we're answering your question, Debbie, uh, about what to do in Naples. So get to Baia. It's 2 a.m. in Sydney. Oh, wow, thank you so much for waking up and joining in. Hopefully you're not needing too much coffee uh, to keep your eyes open during this. And we can uh, so do shout with your questions Dora as well thank you so much for tuning in from the other side of the world so Baia the ancient Greek uh, ancient Roman I should say seaside town where Romans went to get up to all sorts of things that they certainly wouldn't get up to in Rome it was the sort of place you went to where um, what went on in Baia stayed in Baia uh, we have ancient Roman love poets who talk about to say to their girlfriends please don't go you'll never be the same again if you come back um, and uh, but Baia there's a fantastic ancient uh, site there today a massive Massive spa complex, we would call it, uh, that you can see and uh, visit in some kind of uh, beautiful kind of indoor swimming pools of the Roman era. But also, if you are like getting wet in the water, you can go to Italy's first underwater archaeological site, which is off the uh, shore of Baia, which that shoreline used to be very, very different uh, due to the Earth sort of moving up and down due to the volcanic activity underneath. Part of what used to be on shore is now underwater. And you can visit the ancient Roman villas, the luxury Roman villas that used to be along the shoreline and you can do that by uh, snorkeling if you can scuba dive you can actually dive down and see some of the stuff at the bottom as we did in Italy's Invisible Cities or you can just take a glass bottom boat um, and uh, see uh, the different uh, sites from there so it's everything from ports luxury villas to mosaic floors it's absolutely worth your while so get out there to those Debbie um, did you see Caroline Lawrence uh, tweeted this week that she's been in Naples Museum filming and uh, they produced a glass bottle full of olive oil dating from the eruption of Pompeii of AD 79 along with a loaf of carbonized bread. Um, unbelievable to think that these things still survive, although no one's quite willing to try the olive oil and see if it's any good anymore, although I'm sure it's pretty good. Hello, Reg Rupert. So glad you could say it. Join Sarah. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much for tuning in. So that's what to do if you head to Naples. Uh, Richard Jones has had a great question. Um, kind of uh, where, what's the general opinion on what Greek fire was made for. So Greek fire was this mysterious substance that you hear about in a lot of the sources that from ancient Greeks through the Hellenistic world, Rome world, Byzantine world was this material that they could throw out that was sort of instantly flammable um, and would offices, uh, often be set to, on ships and uh, on different wooden uh, kind of fortifications and structures to just sort of set them burning to the ground. 
People often thought it was a kind of uh, a saltpeter mix, so a kind of early cooked version of gunpowder. Uh, but then there were indications that it could even keep on uh, burning underwater when exposed to water, which meant that it had to be perhaps something to do with quicklime. But again, people are moving away from that and thinking that it might have been some kind of crude petroleum. So actually a kind of early napalm, uh, if you like, coming from some of the, the natural oil wells that exist in those parts of the world, particularly around the Black Sea. Uh, and around there. So, Evie, hello, uh, nice to see you, Sarah. What do you think, make of the new date regarding the eruption of Vesuvius? Yeah, we were talking about this in last week's Q&A, Sarah, thanks very much for bringing it up again. There's been ongoing discussion about it and whether it's a summer uh, August versus October date. There's been some really interesting stuff coming out this week talking about why that matters for particular fields of study and, and for particular expectations about what might one might find in the city as a result of it being one of those two different seasons. Uh, how, much tra how many trading vessels were there? whether they were full, whether they were empty, whether they were more able or less able to help with the evacuations as a result. Um, but it has always been a question mark. I don't think it's been fully kind of grasped uh, across all the different arenas that actually the, the traditional dating of August was all, I always had a question mark by it, even within the uh, famous literary sources, it was always uncertain. So this is kind of adding to that uncertainty and, and possibly kind of tilting us more in the favour of the, um, the autumn date. Uh, but I, mean, I don't know whether you also noticed that from that same place this week that the graffito was discovered, there's been also the announced the discovery of a new number of skeletons at Pompeii, kind of classics in the news moment, we had that early, uh, of a couple, uh, I think it's, uh, what is it, two women and three children. There are actually skeletons being found, which is incredibly exciting because obviously at Pompeii normally what you're dealing with is the uh, the plaster casts uh, are made of the spaces left by the decomposed bodies. But this time we're actually able to get some skeletons, which will be very very exciting. Uh, don't worry, sir. I kind of they're all there to catch up either on the Facebook page if you want to, or indeed on my YouTube channel. And what we do on the YouTube channel uh, with, is for each of the Q and A's, we put in the notes below uh, an outline of all the questions that uh, we've asked and, and sort of topics we covered. So you can quickly look through a particular Q and A to see if there's something of particular interest to you. So you can have a look at it through that. Um, thank you so much. So uh, we go on to a question. So many good questions this week from Christopher Walker. Uh, so, it seems we praise ancient Athens for being the centre of ancient Greek art, uh, and the implication is that the arts flourished in Athens because it was democratic, and often in comparison to artless Sparta. But is that correct? Were not the majority of famous Greek art artists not Athenians? Many of them never completed any works in Athens. This is a really, really interesting question. Thank you, uh, Christopher. Absolutely, there is this tendency, because when we talk about Greece, we so often focus on Athens, partly because that's where our best material evidence comes from, partly because we've been, it's a kind of vicious circle in the sense we've been most interested in Athens, we've excavated most in Athens, therefore most of our material comes in Athens, therefore we're more interested in Athens, therefore we excavate more in Athens, uh, and therefore we have more material, that when we often talk about Greece, we often end up sort of using Athens as that as that shorthand um, and we have to imagine that in the ancient world it was not each city having in the ancient Greek world it was not each city having its own bevy of craftsmen and sculptors and other specialists that were, were Athenian trained in Athens stayed in Athens only worked in Athens actually we need to imagine a model whereby the skilled experts that could come from all over mainland Greece, indeed the wider Greek world, sort of moved like a swarm, if you like, to the different cities as and when those cities had the money to pile into cultural projects. Um, so we see this, you know, we see from the inscribed accounts of who was being paid to do what, whether it be in Athens or elsewhere, that people are coming to work, particularly at that highly skilled level, from all over the place. Um, um, and, you know, absolutely we see if we go to more international uh, pan-Hellenic places like Delphi that we're seeing uh, people coming to the sanctuary from their particular city to help in the construction of a particular monument, but also that city hiring in whoever is uh, reputedly the famous and best to do a sculpture or write a small epigram or write a poem or write an honorific praise ode in honor of their victory, whatever it may be. Uh, and these people are coming from all over Greece. So yes, we have to imagine a much um, wider range of sculptural uh, and artistic and creative cultural skill spread across the Greek world that moved where the money was uh, in a certain, to a certain extent. Um, and that includes Sparta. So this idea of artless Sparta, Sparta that had no interest in doing this kind of stuff because it was only interested in war. More and more, the actual material that's coming out of Sparta itself shows a different picture that actually the Spartans did have 
nice material culture, that they did invest uh, in luxuries, that they did have their own um, innate uh, native kind of uh, sculpturing, sculpting styles, pottery styles, etc. And that in the early centuries, in the archaic period, they had a very active export business as well. So, you know, for one reason or another, that material has not become so uh, so obvious in the Spartan record, partly because we haven't been looking for it because we bought the, the literary pictures of Spartan, Sparta, um, but actually it was there even in Sparta. So Christopher, thank you so much for that. Good afternoon, Anthony. So great you could join. Latifa, how are you? So thank you so much for joining in. Um, and in fact, we had it, Latifa, we've had a question from you this week as well, haven't we? If you had to choose between wearing ancient Greek or Roman military uniform and weapons in battle, which would you choose and why? If I had to play ancient Greek or Roman soldier, which would I choose and why? This is a question for you guys as well. So let me know what you would rather uh, fight as if you had to fight in battle. Would you rather be a Greek hoplite uh, or would you rather be a Roman legionary? Um, I mean, one of the interesting differences is actually in the, the size of their swords. Um, in that Roman swords, the Roman uh, legionary swords were often shorter. Um, and this was so that when they got, when the battle, when the line, battle lines really crunched together, Roman soldiers with those shorter swords were actually much better equipped to engage in that very close hand-to-hand -hand combat um, with the, the blade thus being, because it wasn't so long, being much more maneuverable in less space and able to do more damage when bodies were kind of thrust against one another. Um, so actually the, the, the Roman uh, kit, if you like, was equally set up to uh, help those soldiers even in close combat. But uh, at the other end of the spectrum, and I actually had a chance to try this out once, uh, is the Macedonian phalanx, uh, so created by Philip uh, of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. And he equipped his soldiers famously with a very, very odd looking weapon called a sarissa. Uh, and this is an incredibly long, effectively, spear. And we did a, a program many years ago for television where we were trying out uh, actually being uh, different kind of roles and, and jobs within the ancient world. And one of the things I got to do for a couple of hours was actually have a recreated Sarasa of the same of what we presume to be its weight and using the right materials, etc. And try to actually do anything with it. And it's incredibly difficult. It's very unmaneuverable. If you imagine you've got this thing, which is about, it's about 15 feet long, quite heavy as a result. You're holding just one end of it because you can't have it sticking out behind you because you'll sort of get in the way of the soldiers behind you so you're balancing uh, then as a, at a cantilever point which means you've got a huge weight stretching out in front of you not only do you have to maintain its position but imagine trying to move forward as a coordinated unit with it uh, and sort of uh, turn around if suddenly an enemy came at you from a different direction it was incredibly difficult to move this thing around but if you had an entire phalanx of these people trained how to use this, you have to imagine it moving forward like some kind of giant hedgehog with these spikes 15 feet out in front of the soldiers themselves, which meant they were almost impenetrable to uh, any enemy coming towards them. It would have to get through this sort of forest of spears uh, before they could do anything else. So incredibly difficult to use, but if you were properly trained and if the unit as a whole could work well together, fairly, I think, uh, effective as it proved very much to be. So I would actually probably in the end go for the Macedonian uh, phalanx and a Sarissa, please. Although it sounds like you guys want to be Romans. Cheryl, a Roman, a Roman legionary. Uh, Latifa, you'd be Roman as well, um, kind of thing. Well, you know, kind of thing. You can play these in video games, can't you? You can see the, uh, you can set out a Roman legion uh, against a Spartan phalanx and see kind of uh, how the two would beat in battle. But but don't forget the Macedonian Sarissa is what I'd say. Um, totally other end of the spectrum here. We've had a great question from Richardina Beldo, uh, who talking about uh, the, the Tintin Tabulums, right, kind of, that are sometimes found in excavation. Um, hi, Scott from Bonnie, Scotland. Thank you so much for tuning in. Great stuff. Uh, a tintinabulum. So this is a, well, it, it often refers to actually in a, in a religious sense, uh, um, uh, an, an item that, as you might understand from tintinabulum, makes a sound, makes a bell. It's kind of a ringing noise. But it can also be used to refer to objects that were actually kids' toys, rattles. Uh, and these exist from the ancient Greek and Roman worlds. That they're often terracotta. Uh, in this case, kind of the the, the picture that Richardina sent in is of a small terracotta animal, like a pig, with a, a small um, kind of terracotta ball inside it. So when you shake it, it makes a rattling noise. Um, and we have lots of examples of actually of these kinds of kids' toys that exist. In fact, one of my personal favourites is an ancient Greek one, um, which is a little kind of again animal figurine 
but it's got scratched onto it mummy uh, kind of in ancient Greek so there's this kind of wonderful sense that we can go from kind of the hard-end military battle lines and, and, and big wars of the ancient Greek and Roman world through to some of the most tender moments um, where we can imagine small individual children uh, or perhaps a family of kids playing with these um, things and having fun and beginning to learn about the world through them in exactly the same way as we do today. Um, so Richardina, thank you very much for talking about tintinabulum. Tintinabulums, we should all have a tintinabulum in our lives, uh, uh, which sounds so much better than rattle, doesn't it? I think I'll try to start calling it with, uh, with my daughter, kind of a, t uh, have you got your tintinabulum uh, rather than your uh, rattle? Um, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Kind of, we're well, way off topic, but I just wondered if you'd seen the HBO series Rome. I have seen the HBO series Rome. Saw it many yes, filmed at the Cinecittà Studios uh, in Italy. The lucky, the lucky lot, the lucky cast got to live in Rome for two years as uh, part of the process, the hard duty of filming that series. Um, and I thought it was absolutely great. In fact, one of my undergraduate dissertation students is working on the series and thinking about the representations of uh, the uh, interiors. Uh, in the in the program as well, so we're thinking about that. And in fact, that brings into mind a question that came from Nicholas Stokes, which is, if I had the chance to live a year in modern Rome or modern Athens, which would I choose and why? Here's a question for you guys as well: Which would you choose to live in nowadays, modern modern Rome or modern Athens? If you had a year to go and spend in either, which would you pick? Uh, that's a tough one, and I would like to say. Oh come on, uh, Nicola! Can't I have both a year in a year in each, please? Maybe whether you come back to real life and then go back to the other one for a little while. Um, I think I think they're two very very different cities, and you probably have an excellent experience of this yourselves. That that in Rome, I think you can turn up and you can fall in love with Rome in half an hour. You can wander a couple of streets and 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 feel uh, feel at ease and feel kind of part of the fabric of the place very very quickly. I don't think you can do that in Athens. I think actually many people when they come to Athens find it a very, very different uh, experience, a very frenetic, very difficult to feel at peace in, very difficult to find your place in. And I wrote a little bit about this um, for the uh, Aer Lingus uh, in-flight magazine a month or two ago, um, talking about places to go and, and ways to kind of feel at home within the city of Athens. Um, because I remember my first trip to Athens as didn't start off very well at all. They lost my luggage in the plane on the way out there. It never, ever turned up. Uh, and so I spent the entire week my first ever week in Athens in the same pair of clothes and I sort of retreated pretty quickly to the cultural safety of the McDonald's in Syntagma Square um, to try and feel at home. But I think Athens is one of those cities that uh, once you, you find your spaces and places, you find that little cafe, you find that little uh, glika shop, Greek dessert, sweet glika, um, and you find your space in which you can stand back and observe the city a little bit more. So in Athens that might be up on Le Cavitos Hill or it might be from the Pnyx or it might be from the Acropolis, um, you start to sort of learn to love the city and then I think you end up possibly loving it even more than Rome. So some of you are coming back saying Athens. Alex, you're, you're coming back saying Athens. A couple of others are saying Athens as well. Baklava from Linda, you're an Athens fan, absolutely. Baklava at the kind of, a, it's, it's a must alongside your Uzo, Raki and Zipporo. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think Athens probably for me, if uh, I, I, I had to choose between the two. But again, I go back to say that I would rather uh, quite like to have both. So thank you for so much for joining in for this live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. We're getting through some absolutely amazing questions. Uh, let's take a break now and just have a think about classics in the news, because obviously you know, one of the things that I've been blown away by this week, and I think you two guys have too, is the discovery of this 2,400-year-old ship at the bottom of the Black Sea. Now this has been discovered by a team that have been mapping the bottom of the Black Sea, actually primarily to know more about the landscape at the bottom of the Black Sea to be able to think about seismic activity and the movement of landscapes over millennia. Um, but uh, what they've discovered as a result is an incredible number of shipwrecks surviving, I think they're up to about 58 to 59. <clears throat> Um, and that's because at the bottom of the Black Sea, there are these what are known as, as sort of they're anaerobic, they're, they're non-oxygenated conditions, which means that things are preserved in much better quality 
um, because they're not the, the the organisms that would eat away at the wood and other such things are just not able to survive in the same way. And so we have found a fourth century. The oldest thing they found was just this this previous season that's just been announced this week, a fourth century BC trading ship um, in the Black Sea that is so intact that its mast is still there intact. And even apparently some of the rope work is still there. Um, and I think if you look at some of the links on my Twitter feed uh, at Prof MC Scott, you can see that the team are, have brilliant technology at their disposal. They were able to do a 3D print of the ship that's sitting there at the bottom of the ocean following the laser scans that they've done of it through uh, their submersible craft. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, the idea is to leave it there, <clears throat> but then to study it much more closely and start thinking about what else might be down there, what the ship might have been carrying. And people have said, oh, what's a Greek ship of the 4th century BC doing in the Black Sea? But actually, the Black Sea and around the coast of the Black Sea, there were lots and lots of Greek colonies. Um, and in fact, uh, the northern part of the Black Sea, which is mostly excavated by uh, Russian uh, teams of archaeologists, and then their material goes up to places like the Hermitage uh, Museum in St. Petersburg, they have a collection up there in the Hermitage of, of 400,000 Greek vases. Uh, I don't know whether you saw some years ago, uh, President Putin did one of his kind of macho publicity moments where he turned up on the north coast of the Black Sea and he got into full scuba gear and uh, he dived into the Black Sea and miraculously within about 10 minutes he'd found a beautifully preserved, totally intact uh, end 6th century Greek <coughs> vase. <coughs> yes, mm that had just been waiting uh, for him uh, with his brilliance uh, to be able to discover it uh, right there and then. Of course, hadn't been put down there for him to discover uh, just 10 minutes before that. Uh, but uh, these colonies, particularly in the north coast of the Black Sea, places like Pan Tikapeon, uh, were incredibly important actually in the grain trade. So by the 4th century BC, around the time this ship was sailing that uh, has been found at the bottom of the Black Sea, Athens was getting something like a quarter to a half of its annual grain coming from Panticopeon and the northern coast of the Black Sea. Um, so kind of actually traversing the Black Sea and going up there and bringing the goods back down from the Black Sea into mainland Greece was incredibly important. And you see moments um, during the fourth century when mainland Greece is actually suffering really badly from crop shortages uh, for one reason or another because of the, 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 the hot summers and he's having to call out all different parts of the Mediterranean and get extra grain shipments in. Stuff's coming to it from North Africa uh, or stuff's coming in from the Black Sea. Sarcasm, Charlotte? No, absolutely not. President Putin absolutely discovered that Greek vase at the, at the bottom of the ocean. It was only in a couple of metres of water, but you know, no one else could have done it except uh, President Putin. Bravo, what, a, what an incredible um, archaeologist uh, he would make if he didn't have to go off and do uh, other things. Um, so yes, so kind of this is an absolutely fantastic find and it's going to add such levels of detail to our understanding of how this important shipping trade was ploughing the waters um, all the way um, around the Mediterranean and of course as we know beyond that. So that's been an incredible find. I'm hoping to hear more about that in the weeks to come. The other thing I wanted to kind of flag to you that we've been flagging on the FB page is something that it's, I find extraordinary that it's still always news. The Daily Mail has been talking about the fact that ancient Roman and Greek sculptures were painted. Oh my God! Uh, and not white as they're so often uh, perceived. Now what's fascinating about this is that we've known that ancient Greek and Roman sculptures were painted uh, from pretty much the time that they, uh, lots of this stuff was being excavated. If you go into the uh, British Museum, there, is, there are files of the original colour that was found on the day of excavation of certain sites. Bright blues, bright reds, bright greens, all of this sort of, we've always known this. But partly because we, we have been trained over the centuries, particularly through the Renaissance, to think about uh, ancient sculpture, classical sculpture, as, as, as white marble. I'm thinking about the Parthenon as white marble as it exists today. It's such a strong tendency in our minds that we really just can't accept this fact that we know to be a fact and we've always known to be a fact. And so it keeps being rediscovered, um, kind of as people go, oh my God, shock horror, when actually it's, it's been known about, it's just conveniently been forgotten because we can't shift 
that strongly entrenched cultural idea of ancient white marble. And we, a couple of years ago, we were doing a program called Who Were the Greeks? And we were working with the British Museum and looking with a special, uh, special light um, at some of their ancient Greek sculptures to discover traces of color that are there um, still to be seen to this day. So this is uh, a kind of not news, but it is news. And it's interesting because, uh, because of why it keeps seeming to be news, that we cannot shift our cultural appreciation of a culture to imagine it as a colorful one. Um, because then uh, ancient, the ancient Greek world stops being classical uh, and all our notions of what the classical is and starts feeling pretty garish, um, kind of you know, as it was, full of bright colour. Hello, Frank from uh, Cottbus. Hello, how are the pyramids there? Nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we've got a great question to go back to now from uh, Radrupa. Uh, thank you so much for sending this in. How do you think ancient Greece and their idea of democracy affected or influenced other kingdoms in the ancient world? This is a really interesting question. Uh, Linda from Senate House, great. Are you about to head in for the Hugh Bowden seminar? Uh, he's talking about sounds and smells, I think, of the gods uh, in the seminar at Senate House this afternoon. So have fun. I'm sorry I can't be with you for that. Um, but Rodrigo's question about how did ancient Greek and the ancient Greece and the idea of democracy affect or influence other kingdoms in the ancient world? Well, sometimes actually, interestingly, directly. So the Roman Republic, which supposedly, according to its own histories, was set up in the same year as ancient Athenian democracy, had a much more troubled start and, and a lot more kind of internal rebellions and civil strife. And by the time of the, about the 460s by BC, by the time the Athenian de, uh, democracy actually was flourishing brilliantly and starting to move into the phase of its own empire, the Roman Republic was struggling. And it actually sent an official ambassadorial team to ancient Athens to study what was going on in the city and study its constitution and see what could be learned to take back to try and solve the problem of the ongoing civil strife um, that was part of the Roman Republican story. So we have to imagine a team of Roman ambassadors turning up in Athens, uh, looking at this direct democracy going, oh my God, we definitely don't want this. This is not the sort of thing the Roman Republic wanted. They wanted to keep some hand in the power of the elites. They didn't want this direct democracy thing that was going on in Athens. But they were particularly interested in things like the publication of the laws, how you balanced off the rights and responsibilities of the different parts of society. So in that sense, we can see a direct um, connection. But equally, you know, one of the things we're talking about in this ancient global history uh, course that I'm running for undergraduates at Warwick University is that things aren't always going west elsewhere, right? So we can't always think about democracy and the ideas of the West being exported. What about ideas from other parts of the world coming to the West and to the Mediterranean? So this week we were looking at the Mauryan Empire in India and we were looking at the Edicts of Ashoka. So this is one of the great Mauryan kings, Chandragupta Maurya, followed by his son Bindusara, followed by Ashoka. And Ashoka set up these great edicts, these rock-cut or pillar-cut inscriptions at sort of the limits of the Mauryan world, which stretched up into, uh, across the Hindu Kush and up into what is now Kandahar uh, and uh, in Afghanistan. And there, there is the Kandahar rock inscription kind of set up by Ashoka in the late third century, uh, late uh, uh, mid-third century uh, BC, um, it, both in Greek and Aramaic, uh, talking about what um, he believes in. And particularly, that interestingly, was Buddhism. And in another of his rocky dicks, he talks about the fact that he knows the names of all the Hellenistic kings going through to the Mediterranean world, and he has the fact that he sent Buddhist ambassadors uh, and missionaries uh, to these parts of the world, and that they are really interested in the ideas, the Buddhist ideals uh, and ideas. So we have a, a case here of an Indian king, a Marian Indian king, sending emissaries to teach the Mediterranean West about ideas emanating out of India and supposedly claiming that uh, they have some success. So ideas were going every which way in the ancient world and that's a really important idea for us to get into our heads. Um, time is running around, uh, away from us so quickly but I just wanted to flag two exhibitions that are coming up uh, that you might want to put in your diary. So Pharaoh King of Egypt. Um, this is on uh, at the British Museum. Uh, this is going from the 16th of October, so right now through until January the 20th, and it's thinking about Egyptian kingship, so definitely have a, a chance, if you get a chance, go and have a look at that. And then if you have got can go a bit further afield, 
to Grenoble. Um, uh, this is in association with the Louvre Museum. There's another uh, great exhibition about the gods of Egypt, divine worshippers, singers and priests from Amon to Thebes. So thinking about the Egyptian uh, divine world, um, which I think would be absolutely uh, brilliant to uh, get a hold of, but particularly because obviously the Egyptian gods system is, is really interesting in and of itself. Um, but then as Egypt becomes part of both the, the Persian Empire at one point and becomes part of Alexander the Great's Empire and the Hellenistic Empires and the Roman Empire, all those people coming to play with Egypt had to actually deal and engage with its religious system as well as engaging with the religious system that they were bringing alongside it. So that's absolutely uh, fantastically worth getting to if you can get to Grenoble. Take a weekend trip uh, and enjoy it while you're out uh, there. So thank you so much uh, for joining this live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. We will be back next week at four o'clock UK time, Thursday the 1st of November. Absolutely fantastic questions. Thank you so much for sending them in. And there's some more great ones that I haven't had a chance to get around to, but they will be on the list and we will try and get to them next week. So very much look forward to seeing you then. Have a great week, uh, end of the week and weekend in the meantime. And we will We'll see you all again soon. Take care.